Hello, good afternoon, all of you. Sorry for this slight delay. So there was a technical glitch that we all of us got encountered. Uh, but you'll be glad to know we are back online, live, ready to start the webinar. You may still see a bit of preparation going on in our boardroom in Lahore. Um, our apologies for this, but we will definitely cover up for this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Khayam. Thank you, Abu Bakr Saab, once again for taking time out, uh, being with us, starting the webinar. Um, I formally would like to welcome all of you to this marathon session on IFRSs and IASs. Um, let me begin by congratulating Mr. Abu Bakr, uh, others involved in the ACCA team uh, for this being the third consecutive year when we are running extensive sessions on IFRSs and ISs and sharing a new IFRSs and IASs. So the third consecutive year, and you have noticed that every year we see, um, every year we see that the number of participants um, attending these webinars on IFRSs, they increase. Uh, so thank you very much for all the interest that all of you have shown. Let me make a couple of announcements, and after that I'll hand over to Mr. Abu Bakr, who will run you through the um, through all these sessions, 39 hours of learning on IFRSs and ISs. All right, so um, first of all, um, these webinars are all recorded, which means um, those who attend these sessions live, uh, they will directly benefit. Uh, if they want to go back and review any of the content, that option will be available. Um, but just as the, I mean, for about those individuals who, are, who, who will not be able to participate live, they can, for their work commitments or any other reason, they will always be able to go back and view the recordings. The benefit that the live participants get will be that they will get participation certificates for these webinars and using those, all the members attending the sessions will be able to claim verifiable CPD units. However, um, the participants who will be watching recordings will only be able to um, uh, will be able to uh, um, claim non-verifiable units by watching the recordings. So uh, that's the decorum. Um, the certificates of participation will be issued after every topic, which means. Today and tomorrow, we are going to discuss IFRSs and ISS for, I mean, IFRS for leases. And once this discussion is over, once these two webinars are over, we will be able to share uh, the certificates of participation with all of you. Uh, the training material, the handouts, they are all available. They are, uh, they are available to you on your go to webinar menus. So if you see under handouts, there are five handouts uploaded. So those of you who are present, who, who want to download these handouts, they are more than welcome to do so. Uh, the presentation, uh, the handouts are all uploaded. So all of all, everything is, is available to all of you. Um, please make these sessions interactive. Khayam will be available throughout to make sure that your questions are attended to. However, to keep the questions focused, I would strongly urge that you should write down your questions and during the question and answer break, only then put them up. Um, um, we will, considering time, we will try to go through as many questions as possible. However, there could be some repeat questions. And unfortunately, because we are, these are really, really compressed sessions, I mean, I mean, you possibly cannot learn all IFRS and IAS. So they're really compressed, and therefore we will appreciate 
if um, there is a requirement for repeating any content, you go back and view the recording. And therefore, we, we are able to then, in the interest of time, continue with our sessions. So I think that's sufficient housekeeping. Um, please do share your feedback with me. Once again, apologies for the little delay in starting today's webinar, teething issues, but also because I'm not there on ground today. I, I was traveling. I'm in Multan today, Mr. Abu Bakr, uh, and I was remotely trying to manage. Uh, uh, Mr. Abu Bakr was there as well, the experienced uh, webinar trainer. So I am now handing you over to Mr. Abu Bakr. Mr. Abu Bakr, your uh, introduction, please, and then if we may make a formal beginning. I am unmuting your mic right now. So you're on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you. Mr. Harun. And uh, uh, my very brief introduction is uh, I'm a fellow member of fellow member. Okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and respected members. I hope you people can hear me. Okay, so my brief introduction is, uh, my name is Mohammed Abu Bakr. Uh, I'm a fellow member of uh, Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. I'm also a fellow member of uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants in Pakistan. And uh, I'm a partner of uh, Business Advisory Services of Baker Dean Mahmoud Idris Kamar, which is a uh, world number eight uh, organization. Fashion services, and uh, I have uh, more than 15 years of experience uh, on the practical side as well as uh, on the teaching side. So that practical side uh, helps me to uh, illustrate the things in a practical way. Uh, I authored a book uh, named uh, IFRS Application Guide, and uh, that is available in the market. And uh, similarly, I was honored by the uh, CPA of Iran to uh, present the financial instruments. What are the practical uh, implications for the industry of the Iran? Uh, so I was honored uh, to uh, present. I was honored to uh, present my thoughts and my search on the, uh, so far as the effect of the financial instruments, uh, so far as the effect of the new standard on the Iranian industry is concerned. So let's come to the today's session. See, uh, this is the first session in which we will cover uh, leases. And uh, this will run for two days. And at the end of this session, certificates will be issued. Can you please uh, help me by just saying, can you people hear me very clearly so that I feel comfortable while uh, continuing my discussion? Can you please just comment yes or no? Can you please hear me? This will help me to know whether I, I am talking to you or I'm just looking at the camera and just talking to myself. I'm waiting your response. Can you people hear me? Please, either type yes or no, so that if you people cannot hear me, so that we can take appropriate actions. This can check this. I, I suppose you people can hear me. I suppose. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, people can hear me, okay. So, 
in this session uh, we will cover leases first of all we will cover uh, international uh, financial reporting standard 16 and thereafter international accounting standard 17. we shall not cover these two standards uh, in full i will i have selected few aspects of these two standards uh, which are really practically needed and uh, uh, the whole discussion will be I'll, I'll try to be as much practical as possible because the objective of the session is to, ha uh, to help our uh, fellow members and affiliates uh, in their uh, like practical work because international financial reporting standard 16 will become applicable uh, from 1st January 2019. So that's why I, I, I tried, I will try uh, that this session should should be helpful uh, in, in your application of this new standard. See, the reasons behind the issue of this new standard is basically that International Accounting Standard 17 does not truly reflect the economic reality. At the start of the session, uh, we will discuss very briefly what are the major changes uh, in the IFRS 16 are concerned. Like, uh, like in, in case of international accounting standard 70. So, okay. I suppose you people can hear me. Without your command, it will be difficult for me to know whether you people can hear me very clearly or not. See, in International Accounting Standard 17, there was there was two things. One is like uh, that standard int introduced the concept of operating and finance lease. Now there is there is only a single accounting model. A contract can be either a lease or not a lease. Mean so far as the accounting of the lessee is concerned, operating and finance lease concept is no longer there. So this is a big change. Second, all leases go on the balance sheet. All leases, except leases shorter than one year and very small value items. So far as the accounting of uh, accounting for lesser is concerned, that is largely the same as we learned in International Accounting Standard 17. So these are the major changes so far as International Accounting Standard 17 is concerned. Number one, only one single accounting model. Number two, no. All leases go on the balance sheet except very small items or uh, such leases which are shorter than one year. And lesser accounting is the same as we learned in International Accounting Standard 17. What are the benefits of this standard? Number one is there is a better transparency. And there will be much better comparability between companies. There are two big benefits to the market and to the investor. First of all, there is a better transparency. There is more insight 
in the liabilities caused by leases. Second, there will be much better comparability between companies. For example, there are airline companies that own most of their aircraft financed with loans. And on the other hand, there are airliners that lease most of their fleet. In practice, they might have similar financing obligations. But in current practice, the company on air, airplanes have a lot of debt on its balance sheet. Whereas the airplane that leases most of its aircraft will have a clean balance sheet. And that is not a good comparison. And the new standard will create more comparability between these companies. Because the investor will feel that the company currently, the company uh, like uh, who who is uh, who is entered into operating lease? Its balance sheet will be clean. So the true picture, the true situation of the liabilities uh, will not uh, will not uh, uh, will not appear on the face of the balance sheet or in the, uh, maybe to the to some extent in the notes. So by the introduction of International Financial Reporting Standard 16. So now all these liabilities will appear on the balance sheet. So this will this will give a better comparability between uh, between the companies. Those companies uh, who own all the assets and those companies who lease most of their assets. So it will be easy uh, for an investor to compare these two companies. Previously, this was not the case. Most uh, affected companies are most affected companies are like uh, retail industries, airlines, and uh, shipping. And in one line, those companies uh, that have heavy consideration of leases. Uh, these are the most affected companies. Okay. So this was the basic introduction. Now, what are the learning objectives? Number one, at the end of the session, we should be able to appreciate which agreement is a lease and which one is not. Because as I said in the introduction, there is a single accounting model. Any contract, any contract, the standard requires that one has to determine by applying the criteria given in the standard that whether that contract is a lease or not. So this is very important area. If we learn this area, we can apply it practically to see their existing contracts, which normally we can we can say that these are our leases, we will have to apply the criteria given by this standard to see whether those contracts are leased or not. Because if any of those contracts are not leased, this standard will not apply. Any other relevant standard will apply. But if any existing or your future contract is a lease, mean that contract fulfills the criteria given by this standard, then that contract will be treated as lease and that treatment is given in the new standard IFS 16. So I will try to uh, I will try to explain this point with the help of examples uh, given in the standard. Of course, uh, those are very practical examples. So with the help of those examples, we will try to establish how can uh, we determine a contract is a lease or not. This is one learning objective. Second is, you should be able to apply this new standard so far as the lessee accounting is concerned. This is our second learning objective. And we will discuss this aspect at length. 
And the third and the last one, you should be able to practically account for the sale and lease back transactions. These are again such transactions. Uh, when there is a there is a change, huge change so far as the accounting treatment given in IFRS 16 is concerned. Uh, you might be thinking why I'm not covering IFRS 16 first and then I said 17 uh, in this six hour session. In fact, I realized being a, being a professional that I tried to think out those areas where I really can help people. And I tried to uh, avoid that discussion which you can uh, which you can find in the literature uh, routine. Okay, let's start with the first let's start with the first uh, learning objective. And that is that is okay, can you please uh, close the screen no it is not appearing here Decide whether the contract is a lease or something. Two things are important. For one, the asset should be identified. Number two, you have the you have the right to control the use of the asset. I mean, if I just uh, use uh, a pen given over here, so I can. Uh, it is not uh, the slide is not appearing because here it is a different slide here it is a different slide oh, my mouse is not working Okay, just agree with this. I'm uh, on a different on different side, and this is it is showing slide number four, and I want to move it to the slide number eight. Is not. Uh, it is moving over here, but it is not. Uh, ah, I have that one. Okay, give me. Give it to me. This mean. Uh, this this is being brought. It's not being proper. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Key two things. Number one, identified as very simple. Number two, you have the right to control the you have the right to control the use of the asset. You control the asset and the asset is identified. 
identified asset and control that. So let's expand on uh, this concept with the help of uh, examples. So please uh, go to the example number one. This is example number one. A contract between customer and a freight carrier supplier provides customer with the use of 10 rail cars of a particular type for five years. The contract specifies the rail cars. The cars are owned by supplier. Customer determines when and where and which goods are to be transported using the cars. When the cars are not in use, they are kept at customer premises. Customer can use the car for another purpose, for example, storage, if it so chooses. However, the contract specifies that customer cannot transport particular types of cargo, for example, explosives. If a particular car needs to be serviced or repaired, supplier is required to substitute a car of the same type. Otherwise, and other than on default by customer, supplier cannot retrieve the cars during the five-year period. The contract also requires supplier to provide an engine and a driver when requested by customer. Supplier keeps the engine at its premises and provides instructions to the driver detailing customer's request and one engine could be used to transport not only customer goods, but also the goods of other customers. That is, if other customers require the transportation of goods to destination close to the destination requested by customer and within a similar time frame, supplier can choose to attach up to 100 rail cars to the engine. See, if we analyze this uh, situation, first of all, we will discuss about, of course, rail cars. Uh, the contract of 10 rail cars. First criteria is, is the asset identified? The answer to this criteria in this particular situation is yes, because these are 10 identified cars. These are explicitly, if you can see this uh, by contract, these are specifically mentioned in the contract. Once delivered to the customers, cars can be substituted only when they need to be serviced or repaired. This means first criteria, so far as the 10 rail cars are concerned, is being met. Now come to the second. Does the customer uh, control these 10 cars. So there are further two things. We can see the control if number one, customer can obtain the substantial benefits uh, from the asset, number one, and number two, customer can decide how and for what purpose that asset will be used. So here in this case, Customer has the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits. Customer has the exclusive use of the cars throughout the period of use, including when they are not being used to transport customer goods. When they are not being used to transport customer goods, customer can use these cars for other purposes as well, as mentioned in the case study, that customer can store something in those rail cars. So this criteria is being Normally, in most of the situation, this will not be an issue. Normally, this criteria will be met. In, uh, there are situations where this criteria will not, will not meet. Now, come to the second, second uh, criteria. That is the contractual restrictions. A customer has the right to direct the use of the car. Uh, so, this criteria is also being met. Yes, there are restrictions, like uh, you cannot transport uh, a particular type of uh, 
During this discussion, if you have any question, you can type that question. We are not receiving question. Is there any problem? Because previously we requested them to tell us whether they can hear us or not, but I did not receive any response. There are active uh, more uh, approximately 650 audience. And uh, can you please help us in? Uh, No, when when they cannot hear us during my discussion or uh, Uh, and, okay. Question. Okay, I guess there are questions, uh, but uh, in fact, my co-presenter is new. Though I'm, I'm in a, previously running these webinars because I'm not the administrator. So now I can see those questions. Uh, Mr. Salman Dalan. When it will start, so it has all, we have already started. Uh, I'm skipping those questions which are related to uh, like uh, when the webinar will start. 
okay. Uh, okay. Can you please speak a little bit louder? Can you? Okay. So uh, let me see the latest question because there is a long list of questions. Uh, Mr. Muhammad Walid, Mr. Sam Rifakat, I was watching the webinar on food and was only able to send parts switch to PC now. Okay, uh, Mr. Hassan, can you hear us now? Uh, Abdul Rahman Majid said he cannot hear us. And uh, there are a couple of questions. Can you please, uh, because there are a lot of uh, conversation uh, here, can you just quickly answer me a single question? Can you people hear me now? Just write, please. Yes, yes, no, whatever. Okay, okay. A lot of people are saying they can uh, hear me. Thank you very much. Now you can, uh, I'm really sorry, but uh, you can uh, uh, repeat your question. You can repeat your question so that I uh, could answer them one by one before moving to the example number two. But there are some complaints about the distortions. So, uh, but most of uh, our colleagues are saying they can uh, hear uh, clearly, but there are some complaints like Zainab, I mean, how would you account? Okay, uh, let's come to the questions. Okay, Zainab, I mean, said, how would you account for the rail cars and how would you account for the engine portion of the contract? Zainab, uh, rail cars, uh, portion will be treated as a lease because all the all the requirements of the standard are being fulfilled but so far as the engine portion is concerned that is not a lease okay uh, then next question is uh, Aruj Razak Aruj uh, so far as the identification is concerned uh, when we move to the next examples so uh, we will be exploring this aspect to uh, to greater extent uh, i hope when i finish the example and if you still feel that that uh, you need to you want me to clarify a certain aspect uh, of the identification please feel free to write your question uh, mr shuja ahmed said when will the new ifs be applicable in pakistan uh, in pakistan uh, uh, it depends uh, on the regulators, but uh, uh, I'm not uh, very much sure about uh, its application in Pakistan. Uh, for the second part, I did not get what you said. The engine is not identifiable. Yes, engine is not uh, an identifiable asset. Yes, you are right. And not only identifiable asset, but also uh, uh, we do not control. The customer does not control uh, the engine. Then uh, Sayyid Bukas Hussain, leases with small value, is the value defined or is it judgmental or materiality? Uh, no, it is not, uh, it is judgmental, uh, like small items. It depends uh, upon the organization, but in the, uh, in, in the basis of conclusion of the standard, standard setters have uh, like $5,000 in their mind. But uh, largely it is uh, like judgmental. Okay, uh, there is a lot of distortion, Hafsa, Hafsa, I suppose, now you can hear me clearly. Uh, Muhammad Azjal Siddiqui, why the engine is not identified asset for a lease contract? Because for an identified asset, that should be either explicitly identified or implicitly identified. So uh, both both things are not there. So that's why this is uh, not an identified as. I suppose it is clear now. Uh, will we receive the resource you shared through email also? Sure. Muhammad Ahmad Siddiqui definitely will be sharing with you all these resources. Uh, Talha Saeed, I suppose you can hear us now. Uh, well, uh, then Abdul Rahman uh, Majid, so can you please explain the identified asset part again? And also, uh, okay, uh, I think I should move to the next examples because uh, those examples will help us in uh, 
uh, elaborating this identified uh, concept further uh, of customer and supplier. Okay, so let's uh, move to the next example. The next example is example number two. A coffee company, I suppose this is in front of you, a coffee company customer enters into a contract with an airport operator. Please note that uh, because uh, a lot of questions uh, are appearing on the screen, uh, it may not be possible for me to answer all of the questions, but I will try my best to answer as much, as many questions as possible. So, but feel free to uh, send me those questions later on. I will try to answer uh, them, even if you have any practical situation where you want to apply these requirements. Okay. A coffee company customer enters into a contract with an airport operator to use a space in the airport to sell its goods for a three year period. The contract states the amount of space and that the space may be located at any one of several boarding areas within the airport. Supplier has the right to change the location Answer to this question is no. This is not an identified asset. The contract is for space in the airport, and this space can change at the discretion of the supplier. Supplier has the substantive right to substitute the space customer uses in any time without with minimal cost. Anytime with minimal cost, supplier can change the location of the space of this kiosk. This means that location is not specifically explicitly identified in the contract. The practical ability to change the space used by a customer, there are many areas in the airport that meet the specifications for the space in the contract. And supplier has the right to change the location of the space to other space that meets the specification at any time without customer approval. Second is supplier benefits from substituting the space in the airport because substitution allows supplier to make the most effective use of the space. Because of these two reasons, the space is not an identified asset. Yes, chaos is owned by the customer, but this contract is for the space, space for that chaos. So this is not an identified asset. So because the first condition is not being met, so we do not need to consider other conditions because all all the requirements must be met to uh, to uh, declare it uh, a lease uh, contract. Another question arises. Another question arises like this: Meaning, if a supplier has substantive right of substitution, then that asset will be treated as if it is not an identified asset. Please listen carefully. This is very important point. Like if the supplier has the substantive right to substitute the space, then the space is not an identified asset. No. 
what does it mean by uh, substantive right? The meaning of substantive right is like customer will get benefit from that substitution. And there is a minimal cost of this substitution. If these two things are there, please note that. If you have a notebook, this will this will help you in your practical application. Number one, if the supplier will benefit from the substitution of the asset, and there is a minimal cost of this substitution. If these two conditions are there, then that asset will be treated as if it is not an identified asset. Let's move to the further. Let's move to the further. Uh, with the help of uh, other examples. And please uh, keep this thought in front of you. What is the substantive right of substitution? Now, let's move to the example number. Next example, which is uh, example number three, I suppose. Yes, example number three. Customer enters into a 15-year contract with a utilities with a utility company for the right to use three specified physically distinct dark fibers within a larger cable connecting Hong Kong to Tokyo. Customer makes the decision about the use of fibers uh, by connecting each end of the fibers to its electronic equipment. That is, customer likes the fibers and decide what data and how much data those fibers will transport. If the fibers are damaged, supplier is responsible for the repairs and maintenance. Supplier owns extra fibers, but can substitute those for customer fibers only for reasons of repairs, maintenance, or malfunction and is obliged to substitute the fibers in these cases. So the question here is, does the contract contain a lease? See, in this case, so far as the first criteria is concerned, there are three identified fibers. And these fibers are explicitly specified in the contract. And if it is written in the contract that that asset can be substituted in case of repair, maintenance, or malfunctioning, please note that that will not be treated as a substantive right of the supply chain. I repeat again, like if it is mentioned in the contract that supplier can only substitute the asset in case in case of repair, maintenance, and malfunctioning. So this will be this will not be treated as if the supplier has substantive right. So in this case, supplier cannot substitute the fibers other than for reasons of repairs, maintenance, and malfunction. So this means supplier does not have substantive right. So the first condition uh, is met that these three fibers are identified. Now move to the now move to the next criteria that is. Customer has the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits from the use of the fibers over the 15 year period of use. Customer has exclusive use of the fibers throughout the period of the use. So this means this, this is also being met. Now, the last one, uh, customer has the right to direct the use of the fibers. Customer makes the relevant decisions about how and for what purpose the fibers are used by deciding when and whether to light the fibers and when and how much output the fibers will produce. That is what data and how much data those fibers will transport. Customer has the right to change these decisions 
during the 15 year period of use. This means uh, this is a lease contract. This is a lease contract. Let me check if we have uh, questions related to this area. I will try to answer as many questions as possible. From where we will uh, see the questions. Can you please help me? This will be there in the questions. From there we can see the questions. Here are the questions. Question uh, yeah. So we have the question from uh, Sanaula. Question one: If the customer, if the customer asks the supplier to provide him the engine and driver, what will be the accounting treatment uh, for it? Uh, Sanaula, see, uh, of course, engine will be required for the transport of uh, that. Uh, those 10 rail cars. Umar Abhidbar, can you please tell me what, what do you mean by Rohit uh, said he cannot hear us. Rohit, can you please hear, hear us now? Okay, Muhammad Asif Siddiqui. If there are any charges for repairs, will it be covered by a lease contract or it will be treated as a uh, separate contract. Normally, it is it is a part of uh, your uh, lease payments. I mean, if it is mentioned that the supplier will be providing the repair and maintenance service, it could be separate, but uh, normally it is a part of your uh, lease agreement. OK, uh, Rohit said voice is gone. Uh, Arsalan, uh, voice issue again, Salman Hussain, voice link down again, really sorry, but uh, uh, I think Mr. Harun, if he's hearing us, uh, he can look into this uh, matter of sound because a lot of people are saying they cannot hear uh, me. Some of them are saying uh, like they cannot hear me properly. So, I'm not sure. Can you can you tell me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Uh, Gohar Ayub. Go, uh, okay, Rohit, uh, thanks. You can uh, hear me now. Uh, there is a question from Gohar Ayub. Can you please repeat again terms of the recognition of an asset? Gohar, there are very simple two terms. Identified asset and you can control the asset. 
And what is the meaning of control? Two things. You can substantially benefit from the asset and you can uh, uh, decide how and for what purpose that asset will be used. These are in fact two or you can say that three. Like 